Hello everybody and welcome to another lecture of 6837. Today we're going to continue our discussion of real-time rendering by considering the problem of drawing shadows in a 3D scene. Now the really funny thing about rendering real-time shadows is basically how difficult <laughs> it's going to be. Uh, in fact, your homework 5 in 6837 is going to be to implement one of the algorithms that we'll cover today in lecture. Now, this is important to contrast with the ray tracing algorithm. Remember that when we implemented a ray tracer in 6837, adding support for shadows was basically just an extra line of code and reusing your ray object intersection uh, routine that you already wrote when you implemented a ray caster. What we'll see for shadows is that in order to implement shadows in a rasterization pipeline, there are a number of engineering decisions that we have to make, a lot of different options for algorithms that trade off between accuracy and efficiency, and that each one of them is going to require a pretty specialized implementation rather than just a few extra lines of code in your shader. Now, we're going to start out easy today and justify why we spend time talking about shadows for an entire lecture. Now, in some sense, this is a little bit of a goofy consideration. I think we would all agree that shadows are a pretty important aspect of most rendered 3D scenes. But it's also important to spend a few minutes calling out precisely why that's the case. And so on this slide here, uh, you can see a few different reasons why we really care about shadows in the 3D rendered environment. For one, uh, of course, shadows provide an important depth cue, right? By noticing the shadow underneath, uh, oops, by noticing the shadow underneath the ladder here, uh, we can figure out the rough layering of the different features in this 3D scene. They tell us where the different lights are in the scene. Um, and they suggest, of course, a level of realism that we wouldn't have if we didn't have shadows. You know, shadows are things that we see uh, in our everyday life. In fact, shadows are important also just because sometimes they tell us how a scene fits together. Uh, so in particular, uh, one thing they can do is tell you the contact points between different objects in the scene. So for example, if we look at the bottom of the ladder here, you can see that the shadow meets up with the bottom of the physical object, and that gives us some clue as to how those two things relate to one another. In fact, there's some really fun uh, visual artifacts that you can make uh, pretty easily. So here's a photograph of a person standing next to an oil spot on uh, some concrete. Um, but actually, my brain goes back and forth on how it interprets this particular photograph. But there's some version of this where he's somehow levitating above the ground uh, because that ink spot kind of looks like a shadow that should be right underneath his body. Um, so the shadows are really an important cue uh, that tell you a lot about the structure of your scene just by slight variations in color. Uh, in some sense, it's pretty amazing that your visual system is attuned to notice that sort of thing. You'll have to pardon me, I've got a bit of a cold today, so I'm going to be drinking a lot. Okay, so shadows are important uh, for any number of reasons. Um, Another one uh, that I already kind of mentioned was that shadows are an important depth cue in understanding a 3D scene. So here uh, in uh, images A and, oops, looks like I cut off the uh, label, this is image B. Uh, we actually have the same set of four balls. These are in the same positions in the top and the bottom image. And the only thing that we've changed is the position of the shadow, right? So in this case, on the top, the shadows go upward diagonally with the balls, and on the bottom, the shadows form just a horizontal line along the ground plane. Now, both of these images, of course, are just rendered on the flat computer screen, but I think our brain perceives them completely differently. In particular, I think in the top, uh, what we perceive is contact, right? We see the ball as making contact with this square grid um, as the ground. Whereas here, uh, there's some air between the ball and uh, what's underneath it. And of course, that can be explained by viewing the scene from another angle, uh, as we see on the left-hand side here, right? The, uh, the, the bottom scenario is kind of explained by this left image, where the ball is levitating above the ground and then casting a, a shadow. I guess the sun is uh, up here somewhere. And here, uh, the ball is touching the ground, and that's what we see in uh, image A. So I think these are pretty straightforward, but all of this is just to call out the importance of shadows in the 3D rendered environment, right? It's not just some detail that we get for like uh, 
a fun look that makes our image more refined. Shadows are actually really critical as a depth and perceptual cue that we really should get right, uh, even though they're difficult to handle in the real-time graphics pipeline. In fact, uh, people realized this many hundred years ago. This is not a uh, observation that is unique to the computer graphics universe. So in fact, the origin of painting uh, really comes uh, in some sense from uh, shadows. Uh, you know, so here we have uh, uh, people that are being painted by candlelight. And of course, the candle is helping cast a shadow, which is what the artist uh, would trace over. I'm not sure what's going on in the second image. It seems like there's a lot more going on than just uh, shadows, but um, the, the, the basic uh, scientific uh, 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 concept remains here. So in any event, I don't think it's that hard to justify that shadows are important, but it's important to call out and, and just remember that the reason we do this stuff is not just for artistic effect, but also perceptual in that when we engineer our graphic system with each of these features that we add, we need to figure out how much uh, quality it'll add to our final rendered image and whether it's worth the amount of computation time. Now, we already talked about shadows and ray tracing, and so I thought I'd give you a quick reminder, uh, maybe a little bit of review for your exam, uh, about how shadows work in the ray tracing algorithm. So remember in the ray tracing algorithm, rather than looping over objects in the scene, we loop over pixels on the computer screen. We send a ray out and we figure out the first object that the ray runs into. And then if we wanted to handle shadows in our ray tracer, we generated a secondary ray, right? That secondary ray is this orange guy here. And essentially what the secondary ray does is it points from the point of intersection toward the light source. And if there's another object in between that blocks the light source from the object being rendered, then the object being rendered is in a shadow. And otherwise it's not. Now, unfortunately, this algorithm isn't terribly compatible with the rasterization technique that we've laid out in this course. So remember that in rasterization, we draw our scene one object at a time. So what does that mean? That means that we draw the first sphere and then the second sphere and then maybe the box and then maybe the third sphere. But if that's the case, then we really can't send out the secondary ray, right? Because when we send out that secondary ray, we've already forgotten about any of the objects we've already seen. And so we have to go back to the drawing board. Our rasterization technique cannot support this simple uh, ray traced shadow uh, strategy, which is too bad because it's really simple and elegant. So today we're gonna to talk about a few different strategies and uh, variations on the theme for uh, adding shadows to rasterized scenes. Uh, in particular, the one that you should really focus on is shadow mapping. I think that's probably the most common technique in the uh, video game universe, and it's the one that you'll do in your homework. So that's the algorithm that's worth uh, really knowing. We'll also talk about some strategies like percentage closer filtering and cascaded shadow maps whose job is basically to reduce the amount of aliasing that we'll see in the basic shadow map algorithm, which can be pretty substantial. We'll also talk about an alternative technique called shadow volumes. Shadow volumes were popular for a little while in graphics, but they've gone out of uh, fashion lately. The advantage of a shadow volume is going to be that you get a really sharp, high quality shadow, but we'll see that the amount of computation required is likely pretty high. So let's get started. The early applications of shadow maps actually were both in video games and in movies. So uh, some of the early movie rendering pipelines actually weren't ray traced because ray tracing is expensive. So for example, Pixar's Render Man, which is one of the most widely used uh, rendering uh, packages, or at least it was, um, uses a shadow map algorithm to compute its shadows. In fact, this was particularly important uh, for one of their very famous uh, short films, right? This is Luxo Jr. with these cute uh, lamps uh, jumping around. If you've managed to make it this far without watching this uh, short, you should stop this video right now and watch it. It's called Luxo Jr. Um, and of course, in a uh, animated short involving two cute lamps hopping around, you better get the shadows right, you know, because the whole main subject of the uh, story is something that you know, produces light. Uh, and indeed, um, you can actually find the shadow maps from Luxo Jr. So here we uh, see those in the bottom. Not to worry, I'll explain exactly what they are in a, uh, a moment. 
But we'll also see that shadow maps are really the strategy of choice for real-time 3D graphics. So here we see a Battlefield 3 uh, screenshot, and of course there's a giant dramatic shadow being cast right in the middle of the scene here. Actually, many, now that I look at it. Okay. So how do we do shadow mapping? How do we add shadows to our rasterization algorithm? Well, this is all built on a pretty straightforward, but in some sense, pretty profound observation, which is a duality between rendering and casting shadows. I really like this idea. It's somehow philosophically kind of nice. I don't know. It reminds me of like Plato's cave or something. But here's the basic idea. Um, let's say that I'm rendering a scene and my scene has a light source. So here, <laughs> apparently the sun is uh, close to setting and it's casting light on this uh, scene with a church and some houses and a tree. And I want to know whether or not a point should get lit from this particular light. So for instance, um, at this red point here, it does get lit. And at this red point here, it does not. So one way that we could actually figure this out, one really clever observation, is that the set of points that get lit using our light, I know that's tough to say 10 times, are exactly those that are visible from the light. So in particular, let's suppose that we took our light source and we replaced it with a camera. We rendered the scene. Okay, so take a look. The purple here is telling us what is visible from this uh, uh, camera. Visible. <laughs> and what are these purple points? Well, they're exactly the points that actually receive the light from the light source. So that's this nice duality here that I can think of being lit as identical to being visible from the location of the light source. Really clever idea. And that's the basic observation that underlies the shadow mapping algorithm. So here it is uh, kind of mapped out in more detail. So a point is illuminated if and only if the point is visible from the light source. And we know how to compute visibility, right? That's actually what we can do really quickly using the rasterization algorithm, right? The, the Z buffer's job in life is to figure out visibility. So what can we do? Well, in the shadow mapping algorithm, we actually render the scene from the point of view of the light source. We can do that on our GPU, basically by just rasterizing the same way that we're going to rasterize the actual rendered image. But in this case, we don't need the color, right? We just need the depth map because that's what's telling us what's visible. And then when we actually rasterize the scene from the camera position instead of the light position, we're going to use that computed depth buffer to figure out shadows. If that sounds confusing, that's because it is. This is an annoying algorithm to implement. <laughs> but it's quite clever and in practice makes for really nice looking shadows uh, that, that really are not terribly uh, inefficient to compute. They require passing over your scene more than once, which isn't great, but you don't have to do shading. You just have to do the Z buffer computation. Okay, so let's do this in a little more detail. So here's the shadow mapping algorithm. Essentially, it kind of looks like texture mapping, but with some depth information instead. So it's going to happen in two passes. This is our first example, I think, of a multi-pass rendering algorithm in the rasterization world. What that means is that we're going to have to stream through all the 3D objects that we want to render more than one time. So the first time that we do it, it's to compute the shadow map which is going to tell us everything that's visible from the light source. Obviously, we'll have to do that for each light source if there's more than one. And then we're going to do a final pass to render the actual image. So here's what this looks like. So in our first pass, we render everything from the light's point of view. And what we get is this object called a shadow map. What the shadow map tells you is for every pixel on that shadow map, it tells you the depth that you go before you run into something. If you think about it, that's exactly the Z buffer of the scene when rendered from the light's position. Now, in our second pass, what are we gonna do? So now we render it from the eye's perspective, and the eye also fills in its Z buffer. So in particular, let's say that I'm rendering this sphere, and I find this point, which is some distance away from the eye. Well, I can figure out its X, Y, Z position in space given the camera parameters of the eye and the depth from the camera of that intersection. Now I can figure out 
what pixel that corresponds to in the shadow map, right? By applying the camera projection of the light source rather than the camera projection of the eye. And if these two depths agree, the depth to the point that my eye just found and the depth to the light, then I render it as if it were lit and otherwise I don't. So for instance, let's see an example where I don't light. So let's uh, consider this point here. So in this case, I render this point from my eye and I find that it's a certain distance away uh, when I reach the ground and I recover this point X, Y, Z. I apply the camera transformation for the light source, <clears throat> which is going to tell me that uh, the pixel location B in the shadow map is the one that corresponds to this position X, Y, Z. But if I look at the depth map at position B, it tells me that there's some object that's much closer to the light than the position of my intersection, which means that it should be in the shadow. Now, this is one of these algorithms where when I explain it verbally, it sounds really complicated. I feel like I'm talking in circles, but it's actually totally logical. So I would encourage you all to pause this video, think for a few minutes, work through some examples, and make sure that you understand. So the main step here is the shadow map lookup that happens in the second pass. And essentially, um, what we're going to do is just render the scene from the camera's point of view and compare depth values to see if they agree. So in order to do that, we have to project things onto the image plane of the camera. But these are things that we already know how to do using the machinery that we've already developed in 6837. Now, there's a few details that I've totally omitted, and you guys should be totally suspicious of me right now. Um, the main one is that, of course, when I talk about a camera, the abstraction that we've used in 6837 is that it's kind of like a little square sitting in front of my eye, and that's what I render. But most of our light sources have been point light sources, meaning that they project light every which way. So shadow maps don't really support that the way that I've described it so far, right? Our shadow maps are really supporting lights that are like spotlights, right? Because they have to go through um, this little uh, rectangle uh, that I've drawn here. So how can we repair this little issue? Well, we can do that by essentially using different projection matrices for different types of light. So. If we have a spotlight, as I've already discussed, well, then we can use a perspective projection because that is going to do exactly what we want for our uh, light source, right? That's what we've, we've already talked about so far in today's lecture. If we want to have a directional light, remember that a directional light is one where all the light rays move parallel. They don't come from a source, really. It's like the sun is really, really far away, so I'm not going to worry about the location. I can do that by maybe still putting an image plane for my light source, but now uh, using an orthographic projection so that all of the rays just go straight out. Notice that there's one difference between this directional light and the sun, <laughs> which is that there has to be a finite extent to my directional light, um, meaning it fills up a rectangle rather than just going off to infinity in either direction. So that's a detail to worry about. But what if I would want a honest to goodness point light, just like we've had in 6837. Well, one thing that I can do is I could take my point light and I can surround it with a cube worth of perspective projections that all fit together. And um, then I'll uh, get the effect that I want. So in this case, um, notice that I'll have to do six different shadow maps in order to simulate my point light. The good news is that actually most light sources in video games and 3D environments don't need to be point lights, right? Like maybe they're light sources that are casting down or something like that. I think it's pretty uncommon to just have this like floating orb, which is sending light in every possible direction. But if you want to do it, that's how you put a cube of uh, shadow maps all surrounding the light source. Okay, so to bring a little bit more detail to uh, what I mentioned, of course, we do have to be a little bit careful about field of view. Remember we talked about the view frustum when we talked about camera projections in rasterization? Well, there's still a view frustum and clip planes and all that good stuff that show up when we talk about uh, shadow mapping as well. And essentially, this is the volume worth of uh, places where I get useful information about uh, my, my uh, rasterization. And so typically, we have to be quite careful to choose uh, the parameters of our 
shadow map so that it basically covers anything we expect to see uh, when we do our rendering. And we'll have a bunch of special cases for like what to do if we render something outside of this box. Notice that there's actually no standard, like physics doesn't tell us what to do in that case. It's just what you think is the best behavior for your video game. Okay. So there's all kinds of details that one might worry about. Um, they're worth mentioning. I think some of them show up on the assignment. Um, one of them is that uh, our normalized device uh, coordinates are typically between minus one and one. That's how we scale our uh, depth values. Uh, and so we need to account for that quite carefully. So in particular, uh, when we compute, uh, you know, our, our, our shadow mapping per fragment algorithm here, uh, maybe it looks like this. So the first thing that we do is we draw the scene from the perspective of the light, and then we uh, change the camera uh, to the uh, eyeball. We set the frame buffer to the default, and then we draw the scene uh, there using a shadow uh, mapped uh, shader. But now uh, we have to be super careful um, because of course our normalized device coordinates could be different depending on um, what software we're using. So for instance, um, I think typically the standard in, in uh, the device coordinates is to have the y uh, coordinates between minus one and one, maybe your texture is between zero and one and so on. So these are the sorts of details that you should read very carefully in the specs for your assignment in case you need to do a little bit of arithmetic to convert from one to the other. I'm not gonna dwell on this a whole lot, but instead there is a more important um, thing that you should worry about. So here's our shadow mapping per fragment algorithm again. Here we've converted normalized device coordinates to texture coordinates, is one of these details that we mentioned in the assignment. But more importantly, let's say that we compute our depth. Remember at the end of the day, we have to compare the depth of the occluder, right? That's the thing that the shadow map thinks gets lit and the depth that the object you're rendering thinks uh, is at that location. And maybe I just want to check if one is closer than the other, right? Because that's what's going to tell you if you're in the shadow or not. But there's yet another headache, which is that any time we compare numbers in uh, ray tracing or rasterization, we have to be really careful when we worry about exact tests, right? Like in an ideal world, these depths like should agree perfectly when I'm rendering the object that should be lit, but thanks to rounding, it's probably one is slightly larger than the other or vice versa. So just like we had some hacks in ray tracing, we're gonna have to introduce them here as well. In particular, we're gonna to need to introduce a bias into our rasterization algorithm with a shadow map. So what do we do? Well, essentially our goal here is to avoid erroneous self-shadowing. So self-shadowing can happen if like, there's just by, for perturbative reasons, you know, you shouldn't be shadowed, but your depth comparison isn't exactly right. So we add a small fudge factor to account for that. But choosing that fudge factor actually is not so easy. This is a bit of a tricky parameter and one that I've seen fail in uh, 837 student uh, homework uh, assignments. So here's an example of what this looks like. So typically what we do is we actually add a bit of a bias to our occluder Z value when we do our comparison, and the reason that we do that is to avoid this self-shadowing artifact where rounding caused our comparison to not be exact. So on the left-hand side, we see a nearly perfect shadow. If you look really closely right there, you'll see that there's a tiny artifact, but it's pretty small. If we don't add that bias in, then we get this artifact, it's sometimes called Z-fighting or surface acne. I think the Z-fighting is the more common term. The basic idea here is that depending on whether you round it up or down, the surface might be in a shadow or not. Uh, and, and so that is what you're seeing in these stripes is just the pattern that you're getting from floating point. This is no good. So if we add a bias, well, that artifact goes away, right? This face of the cube now looks correct. But because we added a bias, now there's a bite taken out of the shadow um, because essentially we're being pretty conservative with our decision to put a point in the unlit area. So hopefully that makes sense. The basic point here is that just with any floating point computation that happens during the rendering procedure, we need to introduce a bit of a bias or an epsilon in shadow mapping to account for the fact that we're rounding. And especially in real-time graphics, we're not typically concerned with getting it super precise. 
Um, but this uh, Z fighting artifact really would be undesirable. Now, this isn't the only challenge with uh, shadow mapped uh, shadows. In fact, there are many. <laughs> um, another one that's worth mentioning is a pretty serious aliasing issue that comes up. So here is the shadow cast by a flying teapot over a green floor. It's a pretty psychedelic image, if I do say so myself. And take a look at the shadow that this teapot is casting, right? This is super aliased, right? These are jaggies. If you don't remember what jaggies means, you should probably uh, revisit our uh, lectures on anti-aliasing. And why is that? Well, if we step back and think about it, we now have to deal with the resolution of two different rendered images. One is the usual rendered image, the one that we're drawing from the camera's perspective. But now there's a second potential source of aliasing, which is aliasing in the shadow map. So for instance, let's say that I try to save myself some computation time by making my shadow map really, really small, like a 10 by 10 image. Well, then unfortunately, what I'm gonna end up seeing is a 10 by 10 grid being kind of projected down onto the ground plane. And if my shadow is one of these big dramatic shadows, like what I'm seeing here, well, then that's gonna be a pretty serious issue. And in fact, one of the really interesting things about aliasing in a shadow map is that it can be spatially non-uniform. So that's what we see on the right-hand side here. So in particular, if we look at the back here, there's very little aliasing. And the reason is that essentially there's a pretty big piece of the shadow map which is being dedicated to resolving this piece of the geometry when it gets projected down. On the other hand, there's lots of uh, aliasing uh, at the, what, the spout of the teapot here. And that also makes sense, right? Because here, uh, you know, the shadow uh, is being cast roughly in this direction and the spout is getting stretched out a ton, right? So a relatively small piece of the shadow map image when it's projected onto the ground plane is taking up a ton of space and that stretching is in effect creating a lot of aliasing. So in particular, we see all these jaggies on the side of the teapot. So resolving shadow map aliasing is a bit of a specialized art. You do have to be a little careful about it, but luckily there are some easy ways out. Now let's think about it for a minute. How do we deal with aliasing when we were dealing with images? Well, one thing that we could do is say, okay, so we don't like these jaggies here. So maybe we do a little bit of interpolation. So the obvious way we could do our interpolation might be to look at the shadow map, which contains all these depth values. And rather than just like snapping to the closest pixel when I'm doing my shadow mapping computation, I said do some kind of rounding like bilinear interpolation or something like that. But it turns out that that actually doesn't make a whole lot of sense. In particular, filtering depth creates this kind of funny weighted average of neighboring depth values, which really isn't all that meaningful, right? So for instance, here there's an object at like depth 50 and another at depth one. I'm not sure it means that there's this like linearly changing piece of geometry in between these two uh, depths. And in fact, that really doesn't correspond to anti aliasing It can cause some pretty serious uh, visual artifacts. So filtering the shadow map really doesn't make a whole lot of sense, unfortunately. Now, instead, there's a slight modification of this strategy, which is quite effective. And actually one of the amazing things is that it ends up just making your shadows look a little bit better anyway. This is like one of these happy coincidences. And this strategy is called percentage closer filtering. So the basic idea here is rather than uh, filtering the depth value, we're going to filter the result of the shadow test. So what does that mean? So what that means is that maybe we take a few subsamples inside of our pixel and in each case, we do the same shadow mapping test, but just with really simple snapping in the uh, shadow map. Well, now we compute the fraction of times we get a point inside or outside of the light source. So here we've got, you know, some things are lit, some things are not. 
And that is the fraction of light that our pixel receives. And now <clears throat> that's what we're going to use for our anti-aliased uh, result. So this strategy is called percentage closer filtering. The basic idea here is that we're going to compute the percentage of a uh, pixel which is um, occluded rather than just yes or no is the pixel occluded or something like that. Um, right, so uh, this basic strategy here uh, is that the shadows are smoother and they can have some fractional values. This sort of in some sense is simulating a soft shadow but for the wrong reason, right? This is just a numerical trick. <laughs> But, uh, you know, the, the, even though it's a numerical trick, it just softens uh, the look. So here's, here's what this can look like. So here we use five by five uh, shadows. Um, and notice that we get a nice anti-aliased uh, look here, uh, especially in the distorted areas of the projection, um, which is certainly a better uh, look than, than what we would get otherwise. Of course, setting the bias here can be tricky. Um, and we should be clear that this soft shadow is a byproduct of the algorithm. It is not a byproduct of the lighting setup. All of those two things happen to look okay together. All right. So there are many other tricks out there that are available. Another one is to use cascaded shadow maps. So a basic issue with shadow maps is that there often are too many texels, like these are pixels in the uh, shadow map in the distance and not enough near the uh, camera. So like these green blocks correspond to maybe individual pixels in your shadow map. <clears throat> and so some typical strategies that people use might be actually to use more than one shadow map. So this approach is called a cascaded shadow map. That's what's being shown here. So you can cover your view frustum with multiple shadow maps, which each have sort of different frustum uh, depths associated to it, right? So this shadow map maybe is just for one range of depth values, and then you have another shadow map that only covers the second range of depth values, and so on. And the idea is to use different amounts of precision in these different amounts of depth. And so by doing about five maps with uh, logarithmic spacing, um, we can actually try to uh, really deal with uh, getting the detail right when you're either close to the uh, light or to the viewer. Um, so this is kind of what this looks like. Here the different colors correspond to uh, different pieces of the shadow map being used. Of course, similarly to mid mapping, if we're going to render a complicated scene like this, we also have to deal with the interface between the different shadow maps and probably do a bit of interpolation to hide the fact that something is changing um, in your computational setup. Right, so the bad here is that you can get some visual transitions between your different shadow maps. So you need to do some filtering uh, and you need to render multiple passes now, one per cascade level, which can get expensive, but you can get state-of-the-art image quality when you combine it with percentage closer filtering and some of the other strategies we've already mentioned. Okay, and that's the basic uh, strategy in shadow mapping. So this is one of these algorithms that's conceptually straightforward, but as we've seen, there are both a lot of implementation challenges, like choosing the right ballast, ba oof, bias, um, and also a lot of different extensions, right? Like cascading shadow maps, percentage closer filtering, and so on. So this algorithm is one of the more common ones for shadows, and it's what you'll implement on your homework. Now let's talk about an alternative strategy that also appears in some rendering uh, pipelines. This is also worth mentioning because we'll get the chance to introduce a new object called the stencil buffer, which is useful in a few different rendering strategies in the real-time rendering world. So. Here's the basic idea. What we're going to do is define an object called a shadow volume. Now, a shadow volume really is going to have infinite extent, but in practice, we'll clip it at some depth. And the basic idea here is that we can look at the space, which is covered up by a given object um, that essentially sits between the light and the rest of the world. So for instance, if we look at this chopped off pyramid here, um, I don't know the best way to trace it. <laughs> uh, this object is the shadow uh, volume associated with this blue square here relative to the light at the top of the screen. 
Now, of course, this really should go off to infinity, but we can't do that. So instead, we've chosen to clip it. So in the shadow volume universe, we're going to do something that I believe is, is like kind of a little bit crazy, but amazingly, people have actually managed to get this to work. And one of the really cool things is the detailed shadows that come out as a result. Like there are far fewer aliasing issues than what we see with um, shadow mapping algorithm is that we're actually going to construct all of the different shadow volumes and use them during our rendering procedure. So in particular, here's how we can do that. So if we have a really naive implementation, it looks something like this. When we uh, draw an object, we need to figure out whether the point is inside of a shadow volume cast by a particular light. If it's inside of the shadow volume, well, then we draw it in the shadow. And if it's not inside of a shadow volume, I guess like that, then uh, we do draw it with the light on it. Now, there's a very naive way that we could implement this, which is extremely painfully slow, right? Where to check that for a single point, we would need to iterate over every single object in the scene and every single light to check if I'm in that object's uh, uh, shadow volume or not. But of course, that's going to be infeasible. So we're going to come up with some clever algorithms to get around that computational bound. <coughs> so here's one way to do it. We're going to send a ray from the eye to the visible point that we're going to render. That's marked in uh, green here. Now, what we're going to do is essentially every time that we enter a shadow volume, for example, here, we're going to increment a counter. And every time that we exit a shadow volume, we're going to decrement a counter. OK, so if our counter is not equal to 0 when we uh, follow our ray all the way from the eye to the visible point, then what do we know? Well, if the counter is not equal to 0, then we must be in a shadow because we didn't exit all of the shadow volumes. But if the counter does equal zero, well, then we're not in a shadow volume and we can render as is. Now, the really nice thing is that so far, we don't have any aliasing at all. We're actually doing exact shadow computation for every single point in our scene. Now, what have I not done? Well, I haven't told you how we can carry out this algorithm within the context of the rasterization algorithm. Now, the way that we're going to end up doing that is to implement it in an object called the stencil buffer. <laughs> this is essentially a similar object to the Z buffer, but with less precision, because at the end of the day, we're just keeping track of like, you know, a count of the number of times that a pixel goes uh, through a uh, shadow volume or not. Okay, so here's how we're going to implement shadow volumes with this stencil buffer. Again, the stencil buffer is just another image that your rasterizer can write on with lower precision, maybe even just integers. So here's how we implement it. We're going to initialize our stencil buffer to zero. The first thing that we'll do is we'll draw the scene with only the ambient light, because that's the light that doesn't matter uh, when it comes to occlusion. While we do that, we're going to turn off the frame buffer and um, the Z buffer uh, after that's complete. <laughs> But since we already drew our scene with the ambient light, notice that we already have a correct Z buffer for all the uh, visible objects on the computer screen. Now we're going to make two passes over our shadow volumes. And we're essentially going to divide them into two sets. And those sets are the front facing shadow polygons and the back facing shadow polygons. So let's uh, see if we can isolate an example here. So here is one shadow volume. The faces of the shadow volume are called shadow polygons. And now let's label uh, two different faces of this thing. So here's one. This is called front facing. And here's another one, which is back facing. So what is the difference between these two faces of the uh, shadow polygon? Well, essentially, it has to do with the dot product between the normal, the outward facing normal to the shadow polygon and the direction to the eye. So if that dot product is positive, then it's a front facing 
shadow polygon, meaning that it's facing the camera. And if that dot product is negative, then it's a back facing one. Why do I do that? Well, I know that as I render my object here, every time that I, the ray from my eye to the Z buffer location, um, every time that it encounters a front facing uh, shadow polygon, I should increment my counter because I just entered a shadow volume. And every time I see a back facing shadow polygon, I should decrement. So hopefully that makes some sense. So essentially what I've done is I kind of reshuffled my for loop from the previous slide, right? In the previous slide, um, we, uh, oops, I've lost my mouse here. Ah. Right, over here, I've just described this algorithm in kind of a uh, ray tracing style, right? Where I'm following a ray and every time it enters or leaves a uh, shadow volume, I increment or decrement. But now, oops, <clears throat> In this uh, version of the shadow volume algorithm, which is identical, this is just a reshuffling of for loops. Instead, we're drawing it one shadow polygon at a time and incrementing and decrementing all the counters over the entire stencil buffer at once. Okay, obviously I'll only do that if, if uh, the, the shadow polygon is in front of the Z buffer. So then I can turn on my lighting and redraw all the pixels that have counter equal to zero. That's in the stencil buffer. Now, of course, if your eye is in the shadow, then this algorithm gets to be kind of a headache. <laughs> um, this is kind of annoying because now a counter of zero doesn't do the right thing, right? Because here, notice that your eye is actually inside one of the shadow polygons. So you'll always get a count that's non-zero. So there's a few different solutions. You could either figure out what the correct value is. Um, you could try to clip the shadow volumes to only be in front of your eye, um, which is a little tricky geometrically, but it's possible. Or there are some specific types of shadow volumes that can uh, try and solve this issue. So hopefully this basic algorithm makes some sense to you guys. The basic point here is that I first draw my scene with the ambient light, which also gives me the Z buffer for my scene. Now I pass through all the shadow polygons. And for each one, if it's front facing, which will be true for the whole polygon, by the way, I believe. Yeah. Um, then I increment the counter in the stencil buffer. If it's back facing, I decrement. And now when I look at the stencil buffer, exactly those pixels where the counter equals zero are the ones that I need to light. Really sneaky technique. Okay. So the reason to do the shadow uh, volume algorithm is that you get basically shadows without any aliasing, right? Because this is happening at every single pixel using the exact volume, which is covered by each piece of geometry in your scene. On the other hand, this algorithm is painfully slow, even with the stencil buffer trick that I outlined for you all. Um, that makes sense, right? Because essentially you're asking to rasterize every possible shadow volume, which is every polygon that could possibly cast a shadow on your computer screen, you've got to pass over multiple times uh, in order to get this algorithm to work. So there are some ways to optimize this approach. So for instance, one thing that you can do <clears throat> is only use silhouette edges um, to essentially simplify the shadow volume. So for instance, uh, in this house here, um, we kind of know that maybe we don't need to include the uh, chimney, depending on uh, how things are. And moreover, that we can make one giant shadow volume by gluing together all the faces that are front facing until I find that one that transitions to a back facing thing, because that's where a shadow volume kind of leaves the surface into 3D space. But this is just a trick, and there are many scenes that don't admit this nice simplification, in which case, well, you gotta rasterize a lot of shadow volumes, which is expensive. No. So shadow volumes are a little passe at this point. Um, it is possible to implement them efficiently using the stencil buffer. The Dune, Doom 3 engine does this particularly well. And it's pretty amazing what they're able to pull off. I mean, if you look at the shadow costs, you know, that is cast by this creepy, uh, well, I don't know what he is. You'll see that it has no uh, aliasing to speak of, really. And so for that reason, they had their 15 minutes of popularity. But the challenge comes when your geometry ends up being very complex. So let's say that I wanted to do shadow volume with this tree here. 
Well, remember this term that we've already mentioned in previous lectures called overdraw. So what's going on in overdraw? Well, the basic idea is that we end up doing a ton of unnecessary work for each pixel in our scene. And indeed, that's the case here because maybe there's like a million triangles in this tree. Every single one of them is now casting some like giant uh, shadow volume. Oops, oh no. That, got, that comes all the way from the leaf down like that. Right? And all of these different shadow volumes end up overlapping a ton, um, which is a ton of work that is just unnecessary. And so um, this is particularly bad on tile-based mobile GPUs where you have to multiply that by the number of tiles. Um, so shadow volumes are just really hard to implement efficiently, even if the shadows themselves are extremely high quality. Okay, so that's the basic uh, summary for today. And we've covered two different strategies for uh, drawing shadows, um, shadow maps and shadow volumes. Shadow maps being the more efficient but less accurate one, and shadow volumes being, you know, basically perfectly accurate, you know, capturing the sha shape of the shadow perfectly, but inducing a lot of overdraw in the process. I've included in the slides some links to further reading on shadows, including actually an entire book on real-time shadows, which is a little out of date, admittedly, but this stuff doesn't change that quickly anymore. Um, so I'd encourage you to take a look. I mean, if nothing else, it's just amazing the amount of work that people have gone in just to get this one effect correct on the graphics card. All right, so for our last uh, topic in this lecture, which is admittedly gonna end pretty early, which I think is probably okay by all of you, we're gonna talk about one additional extension of shadow maps that I thought was kind of fun. And that is an idea called deep shadow maps. If you're wondering, this is not deep learning. In fact, I have not seen those two ideas combined together and I'd be kind of curious if somebody could think of a reason why they need to. I'll leave that to our TAs to figure out. Any, in any event, deep shadow maps are essentially a shadow mapping technique which is actually used in the movie studio pipeline. It's not really fast enough for real-time graphics, but it can get some really nice image quality for some very challenging scenes. So it turns out that shadows uh, in movie production often are done using shadow maps. I mean, the reality is that ray traced shadows are still pretty slow um, and that maybe we only use ray casting and ray tracing as a, fa a fallback when there seem to be robustness issues. Certainly that's the way that many of the early animated films like Luxo Jr. were created. But there's some issues. In particular, uh, when we render shadows, in complex movie scenes, oftentimes it's not just one big chunk of an object sitting in front of a light source, but rather something like what I'm showing you here, right? So in this case, I have some material like gas or smoke or whatever, um, which is partially occluding the light, but not 100%. And this is a really common effect. Um, so for instance, in hair, fur, smoke, all of these uh, are basically translucent style um, materials that do cast shadows, um, but the shadows are soft not just because of the light source, but because of the nature of the material itself. So deep shadow maps were developed by uh, Lokovic and uh, Veach many years ago, um, and there's some kind of representation of the fractional visibility uh, through a pixel at all possible depths. It's a really nice idea, um, although it is important to note that um, this really doesn't deal with scattering. So it doesn't like redirect the light, it's just keeping track of the fraction that makes it through. And so the basic idea of this uh, deep shadow map technique is to capture participating media um, where essentially it's not enough to just figure out the depth of the first occluding surface, but rather the attenuation of the light as you go along the light ray. Hopefully you all are familiar with this word attenuation, but if you're not, that's okay. Essentially the attenuation is the fraction of light that survives at a given depth, right? So I can think of making a little plot, you know, so right at uh, zero is where my light source is. And then as I move, oops, I already drew it wrong. As I move through my participating medium, really struggling today. Well, the percent of my light drops off until it maybe goes to zero. So the typical plot, the vertical axis here, 
maybe goes from zero to 100%. And then it's essentially a function of depth from the light to tell you how much light it remains at a different depth. So let's uh, fill that in in a little more detail. So here is the uh, visibility function along depth. And essentially this is the fraction of a pixel's light that's occluded as a function of depth. And so this can be due to small occluders or semi-transparent objects, smoke and volumetric effects. So uh, here we see some examples of all of these things. So for instance, here we have like three windows uh, on the left-hand side, and you can see what happens. Each window drops the light down by some fraction, right, at that location. Um, if you have a semi-transparent object, well, then what's going to happen is every time the light intersects that object, the fraction decreases in some predictable way, and then it stays fixed. Or if you're moving through something like smoke, well, then you're going to end up with... Uh, you know, a, a kind of a smoother drop off of the uh, visibility from one end to the other. And so in the deep shadow map uh, setup, essentially our goal is going to be for each pixel in our shadow map, rather than just keep track of the depth of the first object that my light ray runs into, like for instance, that would be here, right? That would be my shadow map in the way we've described it so far. We're instead going to construct a whole bunch of slices of this function, which give us the fraction of light that make it through. So what do we have to do? Well, this is actually a pretty computationally intensive algorithm. It's actually a fun one to implement. I would encourage some of you guys to maybe think about rendering smoke uh, for your course final project. So there's always a lot of people that do fluids, but then they never know how to render them. <laughs> if you're really good, maybe you can coordinate with, you know, between different teams. So one team does... Uh, the simulation, the other does the rendering, although I guess depending on each other, maybe it's a little dangerous. In any event, <clears throat> what we can do is for each pixel of the shadow map, we send lots of rays or do lots of rasterization at a very high resolution to compute this visibility function for each pixel. And there's an optional compression step that maybe simplifies it a little bit. And then at rendering, what am I gonna do? Well, I'll find a visible point and then I'll have to transform it into those light coordinates and basically figure out the visibility value from this compressed function. So anyway, this is just a nice little extension of the uh, uh, shadow mapping technique that says, I'm gonna keep track as a function of depth, how much light makes it back, um, rather than um, just keeping track of the first thing that my light runs into. Because the deep shadow map is so complicated, a very typical thing to do is to approximate it. So maybe initially when you do your rasterization, you get a plot like what's on the top here. And then you use some simple algorithm that kind of simplifies this thing into just a few line segments. Now, of course, the implementation details for this are in the original deep shadow map paper. But the reality is this is just engineering. Any reasonable function simplifier would probably work okay. But the results are extremely impressive. So here, um, when we render the uh, surface downstairs here, um, the shadows are cast from both the uh, surfaces, which are completely occluding the light, um, as well as the smoke, which is attenuating the light. Uh, and both of those effects are getting caught on the, uh, the ground here, which is pretty amazing. Similarly, if we use deep shadow maps, we can render hair. Um, so on the left hand side we have a hair with self shadowing meaning that the hair can cast a shadow on itself in this case this was done just using a volumetric effect so even though they're rendering the hair like a bunch of, of, of strands i think it's really just treated as some fuzzy function inside of the hairy ball here and if we turn off self shadowing then the hair looks far too bright which makes some sense and this makes sense also if you look at the physics of hair um Hair is definitely a material that's somewhat translucent. Some light gets through and some light does not. Uh, in fact, here is a somewhat disgusting example <laughs> of what that looks like. Um, so here uh, we've used the deep shadow map to literally render a hairy ball. If you're wondering, hairy ball theorem is a theorem for mathematics. It's a cute name. Um, but in any event, um, they also can combine this with uh, different pre-filtering anti-aliasing techniques we've already talked about to do even better. Um, but the basic point is that our hairy ball here is able to cast a nice fuzzy shadow at the end of the day. And in fact, 
A simple extension of this algorithm can even enable motion blur in shadows by essentially, in this case, keeping track of not just a line integral over a translucent material, but thinking of that object with motion blur as itself some kind of a translucent material based on the fraction of time it is at each of these locations. Anyway, this is extremely high level sketch, but just one to get you guys interested in some advanced topics that might be fun to read about. There are many different readings that you can do on uh, shadowing effects. Um, in the slides, I've included some links to some other rendering papers that may be of interest to, uh, to some of you guys. And every year, um, there continue to be more uh, clever algorithms that make shadows even more effective uh, and efficient. So anyway, if you didn't get the details of that, that's okay. The main thing to get out of today's lecture are the idea of shadow maps and shadow volumes where shadow maps are essentially rendering the scene, at least the depth map from the perspective of your light source, and then using that to figure out which things are occluded and which ones are not. And then shadow volumes actually construct the volume that is occluded by every triangle in your scene and use that plus the stencil buffer to figure out what is uh, rendered and what is not with a given light. The advantage of a shadow map is that it's fast and the advantage of a shadow volume is that the anti-aliasing effect is much higher. So with that, we'll conclude our discussion. And at this point, I think we move on to sort of a grab bag of interesting topics in computer graphics for the remainder of this course. So it's nice to see everybody and I'll see you next time.